morning. I see everyone's on time this morning. That's because your body clock went off an hour ago, yeah. right? And uh, you're wondering, you know, you, you kept checking them, checking your watch to make sure everything's okay. I did, at least. I had to check two or three clocks because I don't know which ones, you know, you have some that switch automatically, electronically, because they're our phones, you know, and then there's others. I, I get, now wait, is this... Is this one I have to change, or is this one that changes itself, you know, and so you've got to adjust everything in the house. Oh my God, I mean, it's, a, it's a challenge. And then of course this week was Halloween week, and uh, I don't know whether that was a big deal for you, but it certainly is a big deal for us, because we happen to live on Oak Street in Laguna Beach. We are now at an official Laguna uh, uh, event. If you look at the Laguna Beach calendar for the year, you will now find Oak Street Halloween on our street. They shut the street down, they put barricades, everybody, almost everybody takes part um, doing crazy things to their house. And uh, we turn it into a theme park for, for one night, you know, on your street. You cannot get to your house. Um, and I... I we gave out uh, over 100, about $120 worth of candy. That's the only way I know how to measure it. You know, I, I, there were so many sacks, I pretty much filled up a shopping cart. And we ran out at 8.15. So, uh, my name, I haven't talked to my neighbor yet. She's, she's an elderly lady. She's, she sits there with a clicker. And, and last year it was 1200 And I, I'm sure we were over that this year. Um, the amazing thing is that uh, you get you get uh, as many adults as you have kids, you know, and they're all dressed up and everybody's having a great time. I name and then our other neighbor, they they go nuts. They 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 put up out in the middle of the street uh, one of those balls, you know, that hangs down. You shine shine the light on it and it has all the facets. Disco ball, disco ball in the middle of the street, and the local. We're going to a radio station, 93.5, has their little thing right there on their front yard, front lawn, they're playing blare music and everybody dances. You know? It's quite a deal. Quite a deal. And if you're not into that, you just decide to go somewhere else for that night. And I do have a neighbor across the street who just made sure he wasn't there. Oh, I that's okay. I think you now have to disclose it if you're going to buy a house on Oak Street. You probably have to disclose the fact that you are in a theme park on October 31, and whether you want to take part or not. But I, I've always, uh, I, I've commented about this quite a bit because you know of all that, all the all the negative stuff about Halloween. Did I? I told you a story last week about about the guy that went to the church the church party as, as Satan. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's just, it's that, it's that ridiculous. And uh, that, that we, when we get into legalism and we get into old covenant Christianity, it's just amazing uh, how, how much we can actually, I think, hinder the gospel. Um, just imagine if all the Christians, you know, did not participate in Halloween and on your street, the one night you know the whole neighborhood's going to come to your door, you have a sign, sorry, you know, we're not here, it's dark here, we don't participate in this kind of thing, and uh, what kind of witness is that? When, on the other hand, I found out that on Halloween, it's like one neighborhood uh, progressive party. I mean, because... You know, if you go out with your kids, you're going to meet a lot of parents because they're out too. You're chatting, you getting to know one another, find out what's going on. You know, you get more ground made in terms of neighborhood relationships in one night than you get in half a year. So we need to rethink some of these things, be open and trust God to protect Himself and protect us. Yeah, it's a dangerous world out there, but you know, we are. We are not trying to keep ourselves safe. We don't have to do that. Because Christ prays for us in John 17. He says, I pray, Father, not that you remove them from the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not 
of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So in other words, Christ sends us right in the middle of, of, of a dangerous world where Satan is at work. Yeah, he is. But he doesn't tell us to run away from that. He tells us to run into it. That he is praying for us. That we will be protected from the evil one. So if you're spending a lot of your time trying to be safe from the world, I would say that's counterproductive to the gospel. Nowhere in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, do I see anybody ever praying for safety. They never pray, oh Lord, we're going to go out there and this, we're going to be persecuted. Please keep us safe. No, they say, please give us boldness. That's what they pray for. Give us courage. They knew they might lose their life. They didn't care. They were committed to the gospel of Christ that was going to change the world and change people's lives forever. For eternity. So, they trusted their, their safety to God. Okay. Well, that's a little, that's all parenthetical to the fact that it's now November 2? Three? Oh. Oh, my goodness. Um, we are in 2 Corinthians, as you all know. And today we are in chapter 4. We're going to cover one verse today. Chapter 4, verse 7 is the one we're going to look at. This is where we were yesterday. Leave that up. That's perfect for right now. You do have the next one ready, though. Okay. Yeah. But let's go back to where we were. Because uh, in order to get ready for seven, you have to do this with Scripture all the time. You have to look at the context. And the beauty is, we've been in this, this is week seven, I think. Is that right? This is week, I think this is week seven. By the way, a little commercial here. If you've missed any of these, we are putting them all up on our website at catchjohnfisher.wordpress.com. And you can go there. We've... By, the, by about Thursday of next week, we'll have this one. So, but we've got all six. Um, and they're coming up fairly nice. You can, you can get every word, and uh, you can see well. It's a really nice little video. And that's the way you can maybe share some of this with some of your friends. If they aren't able to come, and you're getting a lot out of it, and you want someone else to be able to enjoy that too. Uh, we should put that up there next time. Catch John Fisher dot WordPress. That has to be in there just because that's the server dot com. Okay, and uh, that that's the way you can keep up with us. And last week we we covered these these verses here, chapter four, three through six. And remember, we talked about the fact that our gospel is veiled to some people. Some people are blinded. They're unable to see the gospel of Christ. And remember our conclusion was that it's, it's really not up to us to try and change their minds, to try and run after them when they run away. Jesus did not run after the rich young ruler. He told them what it would, what it would mean to follow him, and the man turned and walked away, and Jesus didn't go back and say, wait a minute, we need your money in the church. Let's see if we can adjust this a little bit. No, he didn't do that. He just let them walk away. Because those who are drawn are going to come, and those who are not drawn, those who do not see it, don't get it, are blinded. You can, you can try whatever you want. You're not going to get it. Because they're blinded by the God of this world. But then remember, where we finished last week, that doesn't mean they're hopeless. That doesn't mean that it's over for them. Because remember, God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Verse 6. Is the one who shown in our hearts to show the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words... God did a miracle in us. The same God who makes something come out of nothing. That's, that's the creativity of God. We are 
we are little creators in that we have to have raw materials when we create. We have to have something. We, we merely put things together in a new way that hadn't been put together that way before. But God is different than that. God is the big C creator because he just speaks and it becomes out of nothing. And he's the one who out of the darkness of our hearts said, let there be light. And there was like, in other words, it's a miracle that we see. So if you have a friend who is blinded, that doesn't mean that God can't unblind him at any time. That doesn't mean that God can't say, let there be light in his or her life. And it will be. And so that's what we hold out for. And that's what we pray for. For kids, neighbors, people who appear to be not part of, not getting it. We keep praying for them. We don't beat them on the head. We, we can be persuasive. And Paul says, I, I try to persuade everyone. In other words, I'm, I'm going to use you know, the gospel. That's a beautiful thing about biblical truth is it makes good sense. I mean, you can, you can look at Christianity intellectually and it can make good sense. As a matter of fact, that can be a problem for really good Presbyterian people. Presbyterians really get into the intellectual part. Of, of the gospel, you know, and and you can get so into that that you don't have any heart. It, it didn't get all the way down into here, you know. But we're all, you know, we're all making sense out of all this. So you have to have a nice balance. But the gospel does make sense. So you do want to talk, but you just don't want to don't, don't, don't want to push anybody. You don't you don't have to beat them over the head. You can just explain things. And that's why Paul said. You know, we don't, we renounce the things hidden, we don't have to be secretive, and we don't walk in craftiness, and we don't have to adulterate the word, we don't have to change anything, we just, by committing ourselves openly <coughs> in the sight of God, we introduce ourselves to people, and we speak the truth plainly, that's all that's necessary, okay, because the truth will stand on its own, God's word never returns void. Based on all this, then, I want to ask you a couple questions, especially based on that last verse that, that talks about the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? It's hard to get your arms around that. But all of that, the light, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, is our message. Now I want to ask you, we're talking about, this whole class is about being significant. How are we going to make a, a significant difference in the world? Well, that would make a difference. The light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ would make a difference. But I have to ask you a big question. Where, where is this magnificent light on display? Where is it on display? Is it in what? Here we go. Just the question slightly. Where would they see, those who can't see now, where would they see if they could? Okay. Where would they see, where would they see the light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ if they could? Would they see it oh, in a great sermon? By the past. Would they see it in an effective evangelistic crusade? Would they see it through a book by your favorite Christian author? Is that what Paul is saying here? Would they see it in a great, great worship music at our church? That's where they see the light, the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Would they see it in Rick and Kay Warren's CNN interview? Well, maybe, but uh, I don't think that's quite what Paul's talking about here. Would they see in a masterful apologetic by some great Christian intellectual that answers every question a non-Christian could ever have? Are they going to see it there? Where do they see the light, the knowledge, the glory of God in the face of Christ? Answer me, please. <laughs> Thank you. Now, us, us, but it's a little deeper than that. What part of us? Our 
heart. Our words. Our words, but look what it said. Right, I've shown in our hearts. I think all those are true, but the, the point Paul is making right here is it's in our heart. That's where the effect is. It's in our hearts. How will you have an effective, a significant impact on the world? Show your heart. That's me. Open your heart. This whole thing is going to end in chapter 3, verse 13. I'll give you the clue. I'll, I'll spill the beans right now when we get there in verse in week 12. He says, we have opened wide our hearts to you. Now open yours to us. How do you see all this? You open your heart. You show your heart. Well, now that's interesting. How do you do that? How do you show your heart to someone? By witnessing? Door-to-door -door evangelism. Surveys on the beach. The four spiritual laws? How do you show your heart? Anybody? Your life? Transparency. Transparency. I'm sorry, one more time. Transparency. Transparency? Yeah. Where does that come from? Where's that going to be? Relationships. Better in a relationship. You can't show your heart. Well, I guess you can if you're really a great artist. Maybe you could write a song or, or, or a book that shows your heart. So that long list that I gave you, um, there are pieces of it of the truth in there. Yeah, though some of those things, your sermon shows his heart, hopefully your pastor shows his heart. All those things, the evangelistic crusade shows some heart. You know? But I think what Paul is really saying here is those are all little pieces. And what's going to put those pieces all together for somebody is a relationship with you. That's what's going to do it. And if you listen to anybody tell you how they became a Christian, they're going to usually almost always point to a person. There might have been a lot of people adding up, but it all came down to one person that brought it home to them because they show they showed their heart. It's, it's a relationship. It's give and exchange. Give and take. This is very important for us. I want to take just a little time. This isn't in the passage, but this is a little bit of my interpretation. Because I think a relationship, to be a good relationship, has to be have respect, and it has to show good give and take. I don't think anyone is going to ever really see my heart if I'm not open to seeing their heart. If I'm not listening and giving and being attentive to their needs and their hopes and their dreams. Have any of you ever seen the movie The Big Kahuna? Oh my gosh. How many of you like movies? How many of you go out and rent movies? Or... <laughs> your assignment for next week, I'm serious, this is your assignment next week. I'm going to ask how many people did it, is to go out and find the big kahuna. If you have to buy it, buy it, download it, whatever you do, get the big kahuna. Okay? It's Danny DeVito, Kevin Spacey, and a guy named Peter Brown and Shirley or something like that. Three guys. Because it's a play. It's one of these character movies. People like me, these are the movies we love, you guys. You know, my kids can't stand the movie like this. <laughs> because it all takes place in run, one room with three people. You see their faces real close for an hour and a half. But the dialogue and what goes on, because it was a play. It was called Hospitality Suite. And the guy who wrote this play was definitely a Baptist. There's just no doubt in my mind that he was a Baptist because he has a young kid fresh out of college and it would have to have been a Bible college on his first business trip with two guys with Kevin Spacey and Danny DeVito. 
And one was foul mouth, and the other is kind of in the at end of his, you know, kind of the the, uh, the twilight of his years. You know, that's that's the that's the part that, that Kevin Spacey plays, and he he plays somebody who's he's, he's, been, he's really asking the real questions. Actually, he is the one who who has the truth, even though the kid has every right thing that a Christian would ever want to have or say in any situation. He nails it every time. You go, wow, that's why I know this guy went to Bible school, you know? Because he has all the perfect answers. And yet, and yet, he's too young, and it's all up here, and he's not living it, and he's not any, in any real relationship with those two guys. He's not listening to them. He's just waiting for his chance to talk. And he gets a chance. He, the whole crux of the movie is they are there in Wichita on a business conference to meet one guy at a conference. This is big guy. He's the big kahuna. And the, the big kahuna is the CEO of a big company. And their, their company makes uh, industrial lubricants. And if they can land this guy, well, they're, they are set for years. Okay? So they're there to land this one guy and, and to throw a big meeting at their part at their uh, hospitality suite in, in their holiday inn. And they throw the party. And of course, the Bible, they assign the Bible guy to do in the bar. So great. He's got a book open and he's trying to keep it all going. It's beautiful. You know. And then the whole thing is over and they're completely dejected because. He didn't show up. He didn't show up. And, uh, however, when they're talking to the young Christian kid, they say, well, well, what did you do? You know, these guys are totally, you know, well, we totally failed. What are we going to tell the boss now? You know. Um, well, so what did you do? Well, I talked to this one guy. Uh, okay, I said, we well, Pretty much the whole time. So who was he? Well, I don't know. Here, here's his card. Pulls out his card. It's the guy. <laughs> he was wearing somebody else's name tag because he didn't want to be, you know, he didn't want to be hooked at this meeting. And he said, whoa, you, you, well, what did you talk about? Jesus. You talking about Jesus? <laughs> oh, it's so great. Kevin Spacey is so perfect. The lines, you know, laugh yourself silly. No. But there's a serious part with Danny DeVito when he says to the young kid, this is the reason I gave you this whole story and now I'm forgetting <laughs> what it was. Oh! He says, you know, if you have something, you know, if you really care about somebody, ask him about his kids. Ask him about his dream. You know, otherwise, you're just a salesman. You're just pushing Jesus. Is that what you want to be? And another point, the greatest line of all, he says, says to this kid, your problem is that you haven't lived long enough to regret anything. <laughs> and Bob, the young Christian kid, who you admire, he's beautiful, he plays it so perfect, he's like me, I just identify so much, he's just like me when I was his age, exactly. He's got all the answers. And he really does love God. He really, you know that. It's beautifully done. And he goes, you mean I have to do something wrong? Something I'll regret? Just to have character? You know, he says, no, Bob. You've done plenty of things to regret. You just don't know what they are. <laughs> That's worth it. Okay, if I whet your appetite enough, you're going to go out and get stick and and watch it. We'll talk about it next week. Show your heart. Show your heart. Bob didn't have a chance to show his heart. Probably the most heart in that movie is uh, when Bob was out, because they had to send him out, and he's the, old, the, the, the big kahuna invited him to his party. And he didn't invite the other because they had to send Bob. So while he's gone... Spacey and DeVito, they have a talk, and there's a, a ton of heart in that talk. You know, as
it's stuff like, you know, what they talk about death, life, and eternity. They talk about everything. It's very real. Very raw. It's a great, great movie. That's how you do it. You show your heart. You get in relationship, and you have to be in a deep enough relationship that you get to your heart and not just surface stuff. You gotta get there. Otherwise, no one's gonna see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. They're gonna miss it. Just not gonna see deep enough. We uh we lived in New England for seven years <coughs> in the eighties. And part of that was me just trying to get away from uh, you know, the Jesus movement and all of the stuff that had that I was involved in through my music and touring and all of that through this through all the seventies. And trying to figure out what am I going to do now with my life. And there was something about New England that drew me, because I traveled around a lot of places in the country, but uh, I, I spoke a number of times at Gordon College, which is in New uh, 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 Wyndham, Massachusetts. And we, in Newburyport, my wife and I sat in a, in a restaurant there called Michael's Harborside. And, and I said, I told him, I think we're going to live here someday. There was just, I just, there was a sense of, it was probably a prophetic nature that God and sure enough, we did. I picked up my family and we moved to New England. Part of what I wanted to do, I wanted to start over and I wanted to move into a neighborhood that I knew, I knew New England was a place where you really had neighborhoods. People, people really were neighbors. They committed themselves. There was a certain community level. And we have it here, but not quite like they do. And so I wanted to experience that. As a matter of fact, when, when I got there, about Two or three years after we got there, I wrote a song. It was called Here in New England. Life is old, winters are cold, minds are made up, blinds are down, new ideas meet with a frown. But, but ties are strong here, and we've been drawn here. There's something for us and something for them here in New England. Patriots' fame isn't a game. The blood that was shed on neighboring hills still paints the red when autumn chills. The flag is respected, and we are indebted. There's something for us and something for them here in New England. Pacific blue is another hue, but the frozen sunlight shines on whitened walls of older times. Our, our faith is young here. Our song is unsung here. But there's something for us and something for them here in New England. Here's what I love about that song. I love about my favorite line in that whole song is something for us. That's really important for us as Christians. Because I grew up with an evangelical Christianity that never taught about what I could get from anybody especially a non-Christian. It was what I was going to give. Something for them. Everything was geared to that other person. To giving them the gospel. Good, getting an opportunity to share. Getting the opportunity to do this. You know, getting them to church. Getting them, <clears throat> giving them a survey. Figuring, just like in the big, big kahuna, you know, figuring out how to uh, bring up the subject. So that I could hone in on what I was there for. No one ever taught me that there was something for me. No one, nobody ever taught me how to listen, how to care about somebody else. And I, I share all this with you is because this is paramount to showing your heart. You can't show your heart unless you're willing to see someone else's heart. And unless you spend the time necessary to build a relationship of trust so that they will open their heart. You don't open your heart to just anybody. It, there has to be a level of trust. And so I believe that is the way we're going to have a significant relationship with people is by listening and caring for them 
Because in the process, we will always have that opportunity to open our heart to. But you really need to start with them first. Trying to develop a safe, a safe environment for them to open their heart to you. There are a lot of new things that, that we experienced. We did get to know our neighbors pretty well. The most fun I had, uh, I found out I really had fun with people who weren't Christians. <laughs> and I never, you know, I wasn't allowed to do that when I was growing up. And uh, in fact, my, my wife worked with uh, uh, the uh, uh, women, uh, YMCA, the, the YMCA in town. She, she got quite involved there. And, and we got to know three other couples who were very involved there. And one thing led to another, and we, the four of us, turned into what we call the dancing fools. And what we would do is every month we would get at, we, we went around the horn as far as houses, we would get in somebody else's houses, and they would, they would, we'd do a dinner, we'd all get together and have dinner, and we'd push everything back and put on the music and we'd dance. That's what we did. Dancing fools. And, uh, that was rich. I, I love that. And that opened up opportunities to befriend people. And I found out, lo and behold, I really fell in love with these people. These are, these are beautiful people. They're smart, intelligent, they have heart, they have dreams, they have their kids to talk about. Did you, did you ask him about his kids? Did you ask him about his dreams? That's where it starts. We need to show our heart, but our heart will come out of relationship. And now, for the last part, the one verse we're really going to study, and even though we have eight minutes to do it, it's going to be fine, because you all know this verse, and you're all ready for it. Okay? This is the... This is where the whole New Covenant thing comes together. And it starts with what word? Verse 7. What does it start with? Five. Ah, whoa, where have you seen that before? Huh? Do you remember that word? Chapter 2, verse 12. By the way, it was one of the first words we studied when we started this. And do you remember the context? But, thanks be to God. And why was that? What, why was he having to say, but, thanks be to God? Instead of, and, thanks be to God. It was but. Because it was in contrast. Missed opportunity. Missed opportunity. Anxiety of his heart. In that instance, the but was a contrast to his own human limitations. And he could say, but thanks be to God anyway. Here it's, a, here it's the opposite. It's a little, the other way around. Here, the but takes something, verse 6, that's remarkable. The light, the knowledge, the glory of God in the face of Christ, my goodness, that is in us. And it says, but, but we have that all in earthen vessels or in a jar of clay, so that there will be no doubt where the power comes from. You see? That but is so important. Every time that shows up, there's a contrast. And I've used that word a lot in this study, but the contrast is really important to our effectiveness and it's very, very important to the newcomer. <clears throat> And here the contrast is between our fragility, jars, fragile jars of clay, earthenware vessels, common, there was nothing more common in Paul's day than clay pots. They used it for, for everything. They used pottery for water, they used it for containing things, they used it for utensils, everything. When, when they do archaeological digs, they're, the one thing they always find more than anything are pieces of broken pottery. They're called potsherds. They give them a name. Archaeologists have a name for them. 
potsherds, pieces of broken pottery, because that was everywhere. The most common thing around. And Paul is saying, but he takes this magnificent thing and puts it in a clay pot. <laughs> what a silly thing to do. Puts it in a common, ordinary, breakable clay pot. Why? So that there'll be no doubt where the power comes from. So that people will be, will be impressed with God, with Jesus, and not us. That's what he said in verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ as Lord, and ourselves as bondservants for his own sake. And our lives go through the ringer. That's where we're going to be next week, by the way. The next four, three verses are taking us through the ringer. To show that we are human and ordinary and breakable and fragile, so that people will see the contrast. In Christ. You see, think about this. I want you to think about the fact that I think people will most readily see your heart when you are going through something difficult. Would you agree with that? It's kind of like you don't have any choice. It's a straight road right into your heart, man. When you go through divorce, or you go through struggle, you go through disease, you go through cancer, you go through a kid who's in jail, you go through, you know, say whatever you want. You just can't hide anymore. There's a straight arrow to your heart. And if Christ is there, guess what happens? People are going to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ through your earthen vessel. That's exactly what Paul's saying here. But we have this magnificent thing in a common, ordinary clay pot. I'll leave you with one last illustration. Because this was very significant to me, having been a person who, as a young age, was a performer. I was always in front of people. I did music. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was in the spotlight. I spent a lot of my early years in the spotlight. And I was thinking about when he said earthen vessels. And I started thinking about vessels. I started to think, well, there's some vessels that are in the spotlight. I immediately thought of vessels in our living room that my mother had in a, in a special hutch that had, you know, um, little lights. They were beautiful china cups and saucers and cut glass. It was all on display. And I used to think, boy, they're getting all the attention. But the one thing that... I know about all those things in that hutch is they never got pulled out and they never got used. And if any one of those things could talk, it would say, please take me down and drink some coffee out of me. I, what else am I here for? I don't know what I'm here for. And then I started to think, started to think about well, what in my experience would be more like what Paul's talking about here with the Mark Vessel. Because we, we don't use pottery. We have so many different types of utensils now with aluminum and plastic. And, uh, so, so what would be the common thing we had? At the time, I was living with four other roommates. This was the batching time in my life. You know, the bachelor group in, in Waverly House in, in Palo Alto. And we were all in various stages of training for the ministry. But we made a personal attempt to try and have one meal together, the four of us, one night a week. Try and keep a sense, some sense of family. And, and the one thing we found we could always have uh, was, uh, well, pretty much anything in the refrigerator that we could put Hidden Valley ranch dressing on. <laughs> That's when we discovered it. This was the early days where you had to mix it with mayonnaise, you know, and, and it came in a powder. And uh, we just knocked this out. We love this. It, 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 that's a beautiful thing for whatever was in the refrigerator, put it in a big bowl, put it in Hidden Valley, stir it up, dinner. <laughs> and what do we serve that in? That suddenly I go, oh, there it is. There it is. There's my, there's my vessel. Because every time we served it in a lime green Tupperware salad bowl that you know about because you had one of these or maybe still have. 
and you know how on the edge of it is all bent over because that's where it fell down in the heating element in your a dishwasher and <laughs> melted and so the top doesn't really stay on anymore and down at the bottom are these little pieces of plastic sticking up you know where your knives cut them up and you wonder I'm, uh, how many of those have broken loose and, and I've ingested you know in the last few years and I thought oh boy there it is Paul would love this Paul would love the lime green tupperware salad bowl and he'd say that's what we do. We take the treasure, which is the thing that people really want, which is dinner, and we put that in just a common, ordinary thing. So that the issue is not us, it's what we serve. And when you ask for it, you don't say, please pass the lime green tempura salad bowl, do you? Please pass me those nice, beautiful cut glass uh, utensils. No, you say, please pass the salad. That's what I want. I, I need salad. And that's the way God uses us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the way you want to use us. Forgive us for trying to just always put our best foot forward when all you want is just any foot we have available. Because it's all you. And uh, help us to believe that today and show our heart to somebody this week. Yes, it's in your name. Amen. Amen.